Welcome to the next episode of the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. Today, we're going to talk about an alternative Ethereum programming language to Solidity. We're going to talk about Viper. Um, just a reminder, these slides were created by um, Thomas Plunkett based on the Mastering Ethereum GitHub site by Andreas and Gavin. Uh, Adnan also helped me to create them. And these slides are available under a Creative Commons license, as well as the um, video that's based on these slides. Uh, and these materials are not investment advice or legal advice, they're for educational purposes only. All right, so here's a look at our agenda. We're going to talk about um, why Viper was created. We'll talk about how Viper handles smart contract vulnerabilities. We'll do a comparison between Solidity and Viper, and we'll dive into several particular areas. We'll talk about decorators, we'll talk about functions and variable ordering, we'll talk about compilation and protection against overflow errors at the compiler level, and finally we'll talk about reading and writing data with Viper. So Viper is an experimental smart contract oriented programming language for the Ethereum virtual machine that strives to provide superior auditability by making it easier for developers to produce intelligible code. You know, code that's understandable and readable because when you're doing a smart contract audit, you need to read the code. And it's usually someone other than the one who created it. Um, and in fact, one of the principles of Viper is to make it virtually impossible for developers to write misleading code. Because one of the criticisms of, of Solidity is Solidity is such a powerful language that you can do many things in Solidity that other developers just don't understand. Um, so in this lecture, we're going to look at common problems with smart contracts. We'll introduce the Viper contract programming language and compare it to Solidity, demonstrating the differences. So let's talk about some of the general smart contract uh, vulnerabilities that analysts have found in the industry. So a recent study uh, analyzed nearly 1 million deployed Ethereum smart contracts and found that many of these contracts contain serious vulnerabilities. During their analysis, re researchers outlined three basic categories of trace vulnerabilities that they were able to discover uh, doing static analysis of the smart contracts. So um, they discovered suicidal contracts these are smart contracts that can be killed by an arbitrary address. That is, anyone can come in and kill the smart contract. Uh, greedy contracts, smart contracts can reach a state in which they cannot release ether. So someone deposit ether in it, and then the smart contract can be manipulated in such a way that it can no longer release that ether. Um, and then prodigal contracts, which uh, are smart contracts that can be made to release ether to arbitrary addresses. So a hacker can come in and take all the ether. So the greedy contract isn't quite as bad as the prodigal contract, but it's still bad because the person who deposited ether can't get it. Um, and of course, the suicidal contract is bad as well. So vulnerabilities, you know, these vulnerabilities got into these smart contracts because a programmer put them in there. Um, now you can argue that the programmer did not intend to put these vulnerabilities into their code, but regardless, undesirable smart contract code result can has resulted in the unexpected loss of funds for many Ethereum users. And this is not an ideal state of things. So Viper is designed to make it easier to write secure code or to make it more difficult to accidentally write misleading or vulnerable code that has vulnerabilities like these and many others. So how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna make it easier to write secure code or make it more difficult to accidentally write misleading or vulnerable code? Well, the main approach that Viper follows to make unsafe code harder to write is just get rid of some of the Solidity language features. So if you remember back to, if you've programmed in other programming languages and you remember back to uh, C++ and Java, Java was, written to be a more advanced programming language than C++. And they also wrote it to make it easier to program. So they got rid of, for example, pointers, which are a very powerful language feature, but can also introduce some bugs uh, that are difficult to see. 
Um, and so Java got rid of the pointers idea. Well, in Viper, we're doing the same sort of approach. We're going to get rid of a lot of language features and Solidity, which while they may be powerful enhancements to a developer to write code efficiently, they make the code very hard to debug, very hard to read and understand what's going on. And they introduce various vulnerabilities because of that. And so basically you can think of Solidity uh, I mean, you can think of the relationship between Solidity and Viper as being sort of similar to the relationship between C++ and Java. We're going to get rid of a bunch of the features from Solidity that are somewhat problematic in terms of making code hard to read and just keep the features um, that, you know, are the basic features that we have to have. Now, you can still do everything in Viper that you can do in Solidity. It's still a full featured programming language. It's just that your code is going to be, you know, it's going to take more effort because you don't have some of these coding shortcuts that Solidity has. So for example, let's take a look at um, some of these features we're going to emit. So let's talk about modifiers. So in Solidity, you can write a function using modifiers. Uh, and for example, I show you on the right an example of that. So for example, let's suppose we've got this function change owner, which receives a, an argument uh, named new owner uh, and is of the data type address. It's an Ethereum address and it's a public uh, function. And we're going to, and we've got this only by owner, uh, which is this modifier. And then in the, arguments, I mean, in the body of the function, we set who the new owner of the function is, because this is a change owner function. And, you know, the only by here, if we go look at what that modifier does, it says modifier only by address accepts an argument uh, of type address, which is named account. And then what it does is it sets, um, you know, it requires that the message sender is the account. So, here, what this is going to do is this require this only by when you apply this require statement, it's going to require that the message sender is uh, this owner address that is being passed in. And so if the message sender is the owner address, then they can do this function change owner and do owner new owner. If the message sender is not the owner, then this require statement would fail and you'll get an error when you call change owner. So this modifier you know, modifiers are typically used to make it easy to add something to all the different parts of a contract, for example, or a whole, whole set of contracts. Um, and so this case, if you're planning to have a lot of functions that have a require, uh, if you're planning to have a lot of functions that have a require statement saying, you know, message sender equals a particular account, you might create one of these modifiers to make it easier. However, there can be problems with that. Um, the modifier can impact the smart contracts environment. It could cause later smart side effects or unwanted execution. And so um, what we might decide to do is we might decide to remove the modifiers. Now here we show an example of a modifier changing the contract variable. Uh, we've got modifier only by. Um, in addition to checking to see that the require on the message center is counted, it also updates some of this, this contract variable. So you can put a lot of stuff into a modifier, not just a check like we saw in the second area, uh, the second example. And so Viper has done away with modifiers altogether just because there can be lots of stuff in them and, we, and it's hard to debug them. Instead, the recommendation just put that uh, code right into the function you're, you're, you're using. You know, if you need to have a required statement like this first example, the modifier only by, just type it in in your change owner. Or if you need to have uh, also this some contract variable being updated, just type that in uh, instead of using a modifier to do it. Um, because a modifier means that if someone's performing an audit, not only do they have to read the function change owner, but then they have to go, as soon as they hit this only by, go read what only by does, and then come back to owner and figure out how only by is going to modify uh, this particular function. Instead of making them go through all that complicated gymnastics in their mind, you know, Viper decided, hey, we just don't need these. 
You know, if you're going to make changes to a function, just write it in explicitly. It'll improve the audibility and the readability as you don't have to try and modify the function with the modifier to see what the resulting function is actually doing. Another place where Viper decided that uh, modifications are just too complicated for the auditors is with inheritance. Inheritance is a very powerful programming language uh, to allow programmers to harness the power of code that was written in another place. You know, and on the one hand, developers should always check any on their code that their code is following. However, in certain, it is possible in certain situations, like when time constraints or exhaustion results in lack of concentration, a developer may overlook uh, a line of code that is causing problems. This is even more likely if the developer has to jump around inside a large file while mentally keeping track of the call hierarchy and committing the state of smart contract variables to memory. Um, and in many cases, developers who are using inheritance, they're actually new to the contract that they're inheriting from, and they're inheriting code that was written by someone else. So at first glance, they may think they know what that other contract is doing, but they may not also realize some of the other things that that contract is doing. And so the recommendation from Viper is, is, is that we're going to do away with inheritance. Uh, now, Solidity supports multiple inheritance, as well as polymorphism. Um, where you're acquiring code from multiple different contracts, but Viper does not. Uh, Viper maintains that you know inheritance requires coders and auditors to jump between too many files in order to understand what the program is doing. Um, there's too many potential bugs that can happen. It's you know multiple inheritance can simply make code too complicated to understand. Um, and even the Solidity documentation gives an example of how multiple inheritance can cause problems. And in fact, other job and other programming languages also don't uh, implement multiple inheritance. For example, Java doesn't uh, support multiple inheritance, although C++ does. Let's take a look at uh, inline assembly. Uh, another place where Solidity gives developers a lot of power is through a capability referred to as inline assembly. Uh, inline assembly gives developers low level access to the Ethereum virtual machine, allowing Solidity programs to perform operations by directly accessing uh, the Ethereum virtual machine inst instructions, um, you know, similar to writing assembly code uh, in a program. So for example, the following inline assembly code adds three to a memory location at 0x80. We say three zero x eighty m load add zero x eighty and then store. You know Viper considers that the read. You know this is relatively difficult to read, and there are many. This is a simple example of assembly code. There's obviously many more complicated examples, and so Viper considers the loss of readability to be too high a price to pay for the extra power, and therefore Viper doesn't support inline assembly. You know, and most developers don't like writing assembly code anyways. So it makes perfect sense to get rid of this from uh, Viper. Function overloading is another place where developers you know, got some extra power, but readability suffered. Function overloading allows developers to write multiple functions of the same name. Um, you know, which function is used uh, is going to depend on the arguments that are supplied. So here, for example, we have two versions of test. Uh, the first version of test takes uh, one unsigned integer as an argument. The second version of test takes two unsigned arguments as a. And the way the, comp the compiler and the EVM knows which version of test was called is based on how many uh, integer arguments were passed in. If you passed in one, you get the first version. If you passed in two, you get the second version. And if you passed in some different number of arguments, like zero or more than two, then you don't get either of these. Um, but having multiple functions function definitions with the same name taking different arguments can be confusing. So Viper does not support function overloading. Okay, let's talk about another place where uh, Viper makes some additional changes to the Solidity programming language. And we're gonna talk about variable type 
typecasting. So there are two types of variable typecasting that you can do in a programming language. Implicit typecasting and explicit typecasting. Implicit typecasting is where you don't specify you're doing a typecast. Explicit typecasting is where you do specify you're doing a typecast. So we'll walk through each of them. We'll start with talking about implicit typecasting. Implicit typecasting is often performed at compile time. For example, if a type conversion is semantically sound and no information is likely to be lost, the compiler can perform an implicit conversion. So an example of this would be converting a variable from an 8-bit integer to a 16-bit integer. You know, an 8-bit integer um is smaller than the 16-bit integer and so you're not you know make you're not going to change the number you know if you've got the number 100 that's stored in the 8-bit integer you still have the number 100 when you implicitly cast it to a 16-bit integer the earliest versions of viper allowed implicit typecasting of variables but recent versions do not explicit typecasts can be inserted in solidity unfortunately they can lead to unexpected behavior for example, if you explicitly cast uh, uh, integer of 32 bits to a smaller 16-bit integer, uh, the way that explicit cast works is it reward, simply cuts off the higher order bits. So if you have a very large number, you actually lost some data. If there was data in those first bits that are cut off. Um, so, Viper does not support implicit typecasting uh, because, you know, we want programmers to understand how the code will be executed with explicit clarity. Instead, what we're going to do is Viper has the ability to do explicit typecast, which Solidity has. So what Viper does, though, instead of using allowing explicit uh, casting like Solidity allows here, where someone says unsigned integer 16, B equals unsigned integer 16, A, and we're taking this 32-bit A and converting it and dropping off 1, 2, 3, 4, which is bad, and now variable B is 5, 6, 7, 8. Because that uh, could be potentially bad, what Viper does is it provides a conversion function uh, to perform explicit casts. And this convert function, if it is going to lose data, it throws an exception. So the convert function can only cast if you're not losing any data. Um, and so they don't allow implicit casts at all. And if you do, do want to do a cast, you can do it explicitly. But if you lose data, it throws an exception. So this way, uh, we completely avoid unexpected errors in casting. So this has been a short look at some of the major changes that Viper makes in programming to make smart contracts safer. Uh, tune in next time when I'm going to go deeper into Viper and show you some of the additional places where Viper makes changes in uh, programming smart contracts and really improves the security of smart contracts compared to what you can do with Solidity. So thanks again for watching this episode of the Understanding Crypto Series by Thomas Plunkett on smart contracts and Viper.